I apologize for my voice. I'm still getting over a cold. Uh, so Daniel, if you're videoing this, maybe we can get uh, get it overdubbed later, uh, preferably by David Attenborough. <laughs> My title today is Tolkien and his publishers, but it could as well have been Tolkien's publishers and their author. For publishing is a collaborative effort, at least in its traditional form. Rainer Unwin once gave Christina and me the good advice that publishers need authors as much as authors need publishers. He was referring to the bargain by which authors provide content and publishers make the physical product and put it before the public. One may argue how much this still applies in an age of computer-assisted self-publishing, but it's generally true even now, and at any rate, it was true for Tolkien. I'd like to say a few words uh, about Tolkien's relationships with some of his publishers, a subject about which his biographers have not said nearly as much as might be said, and about his desire to publish, which has been a point of discussion among critics. Charles Dickens is said to have been overwhelmed at the sight of his first publication, The Brief Sketch, so that his eyes were dimmed with joy and pride. Uh, one has to wonder what Tolkien felt when his poem, The Battle of the Eastern Field, appeared in the magazine of King Edward's School, Birmingham, in March 1911. This was his first published imaginative work, following some reports of the School Debating Society. Or when Goblin Feet was chosen for Oxford Poetry 1915, his first work to appear in a book published by B.H. Blackwell. Presumably, on both occasions, it was a feeling of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Tolkien's friends, G.B. Smith and H.T. Wade Gary, who also had poems in the Oxford collection, felt that they and Tolkien were the best of its contributors. <laughs> Tolkien may have agreed. <laughs> At least he seems to have been proud of his achievement at that time, if not years later, when he wished the goblin feet, that unhappy little thing, could be buried forever. <laughs> By the first appearance of Goblin Feet in December 1915, he had written a number of poems and was eager to see them published. He sent them to friends for comment and to his former King Edward school master, R. W. Reynolds. In January 1916, he shared his work also with Dora Owen, who had read Goblin Feet and wanted to include it in an anthology she was preparing for Long Ones. In August 1915, Reynolds had advised Tolkien to proceed with the collection of poems he was then planning, but warned that he shouldn't be disappointed if it fell flat. Under normal circumstances, Tolkien would first have published single poems in some of the many weekly or monthly magazines that, uh, uh, that existed to establish his reputation before considering a volume of collected verse. Apart from the Battle of the Eastern Field, he had published only one other poem, or rather part of one, uh, one poem, as his, the editor had lost half of it. <laughs> from the many willowed margin of the Immemorial Thames in the Stapleton magazine of Exeter College, Oxford. The World War, however, was then nearly into its second year. Tolkien was on active service, and his desire to be a published poet was driven by an understandable urgency. He had not yet entered the trenches, but would do so before long, and the life expectancy of a junior officer at the front was not great. Another Exeter College student, H.R. Preston, had already published in 1915 his first collection of verse, about which Tolkien had delivered paper to an Oxford society. A second collection in 1916 would be posthumous. Tolkien was also energized by his friendship with schoolmates G.B. Smith, Rob Gilson, and Christopher Wiseman, and considered poetry his weapon, as Wiseman put it, in their agreed mission to raise up art and beauty. Tolkien's friends encouraged him to submit his poems to either of the London publishers, Hodder and Stoughton, or Sidgwick and Jackson. Dora Owen also suggested Sidgwick and Jackson, or Elkin Matthews, or John Lane. There would have been several possibilities. I suspect that Tolkien chose Sidgwick and Jackson because they were the publisher of Rupert Brooke, a poet well-loved by G.B. Smith, as by many others, and an early literary martyr of the war, who had died on active service but not in battle, in April 1915. On February 3, 1916, Smith, already posted to France, urged Tolkien to publish by whatever means. 
Make haste, he said, before you come out to this orgy of death and cruelty. Tolkien sent his collection, called the Trumpet's Ferry, to Citric and Jackson within the week. At the end of March, it was rejected. He did not send it to another publisher at once. According to Douglas Anderson, Tolkien tried twice more to publish a selection of his early poems, twice more without success, but not until the 1920s. In 1916, he had a great deal else on his mind. He had married Edith Bratt in late March. In early June, after a period of army training, he left England for France. Rob Gilson was killed in July on the first day of the Somme Offensive. Tolkien, contracting trench fever, was evacuated to the hospital in England in early November. And G.B. Smith was hit by shrapnel at the end of November and died a few days later. Ironically, Smith received a printed collection of his poetry when Tolkien, at that time, did not. A Spring Harvest in 1918, edited by Tolkien and and Wiseman as a memorial to their friend, and I suspect subsidized by R. W. Reynolds. A Spring Harvest was itself considered and evidently rejected by Cedric and Jackson, who were one of the two major publisher of, publishers of soldier poets. Instead, it was issued by their unscrupulous rival, Erskine MacDonald, who published books when their costs were paid by the author himself, if he survived or by his family or friends, and then largely without royalties. Illness having saved him from the trenches, Tolkien in convalescence found more time to write, notably beginning the prose book of lost tales. Thus he went further down a road he had begun to follow in poetry, ultimately developing a private mythology with attendant languages and stories. But we must not forget that he had prepared a university to lead the life of a scholar, and with the end of the war, he joined the staff of the Oxford English Dictionary and established himself as a private tutor. In 1920, he moved to Leeds as part of the faculty of the New English School there, and in 1925, returned to Oxford, where he had two long professorial careers. Then, as now, academics were expected to contribute to the literature of their fields. That Tolkien published relatively little in this regard was a source of dismay to his colleagues and of guilt to himself, even though those works of scholarship he did produce, such as his landmark lecture on Beowulf, <coughs> were widely influential. His failure to produce in greater quantity was not, as some have argued, solely or even mainly because he was too occupied with his imaginative writings. Rather, like colleagues such as George Gordon and Elaine Griffiths, he was a conscientious teacher and administrator who paid as much or more attention to his students' work as to his own. Also significantly, as a writer, he took remarkable pains in all that he did. Humphrey Carpenter has said that Tolkien had a passion for perfection in written work of any kind, whether it be philology or stories. This grew from his emotional commitment to his work, which did not permit him to treat it in any manner other than the deeply serious. Nothing was allowed to reach the printer until it had been revised, reconsidered, and published. One case in point is Tolkien's Middle English vocabulary. A Middle English vocabulary is a glossary for the collection 14th century verse and prose edited by Kenneth Sizen, who had tutored Tolkien at Oxford. The collection had begun as a joint effort by Sizen and A.S. Napier of the Oxford English School, uh, intended for the use of language students with an apparatus strictly linguistic, but was abandoned when Napier died in 1916 and Sizem took a wartime government post. When, after the war, students returned to university in great numbers, <laughs> yes, get a seat, um, uh, Oxford University Press revived 14th century verse and prose as part of an effort to dominate the academic market in books for the study of Middle English. By June 1919, it became apparent that Sizem, then assistant to the chief executive of Oxford University Press, would not himself have time to compile the glossary for his book, as he had intended to do. The task was given instead to Tolkien, whose philological talents Sizem recognized, and who had proved himself on the OED. And it was apparently because he recognized the importance of this commission, which would become his first academic publication that Tolkien set aside, for the most part, work on the Book of Lost Tales. 
That he began to work on the vocabulary of that autumn and winter is evident from annotations he made to related words in office copies of the Oxford English Dictionary, Tolkien still being on the OED staff through May 1920. But it's also clear that work did not progress as quickly as Sizem at Oxford University Press had hoped or in the manner they expected. Tolkien was meant to compile a straightforward glossary to Sizem's text and to do so quickly. <coughs> Quickly. Instead, as he wrote a year later, the Mole Hill Glossary grew into a mountain by accumulated domestic distractions. <laughs> These included his continuing work on the OED, as well as obtaining his academic post at Leeds, moving house, and teaching a heavy load, and the birth of his son Michael. He was able to hand over some material for the glossary in February 1921. By then, however, Sizem's book was already in production and when it appeared in October 1921, it was without Tolkien's part. Not until the following year did Tolkien complete the vocabulary, which was issued separately and only later still as an appendix to Sison's text as originally intended. Peter Gilliver, Jeremy Marshall, and Edmund Weiner in their book, The Ring of Words, described Tolkien's completion of a Middle English vocabulary <coughs> even by 1922 with so many other responsibilities as an astonishing achievement. They explained that he would have had to consider each of some 43,000 words in Sizem's text for possible inclusion in the glossary, from which he produced 4,740 entries and nearly 6,800 definitions, as well as references and cross-references. Nor was Tolkien content with simply glossing major words. Rather, as he wrote in his introduction to the vocabulary, he held that, quote, a good working knowledge of Middle English depends less on the possession of an abstruse vocabulary than on familiarity with the ordinary machinery of expression, with the precise forms and meanings that common words may assume, with the uses of such innocent looking little words as the prepositions of and for. So in the making of a glossary for use with a book itself designed to be a preparation for the reading of complete texts, I have given exceptionally full treatment to what may rightly be called the backbone of the language. Providing such full treatment was typical of Tolkien, as Carpenter has suggested. A Middle English vocabulary was far more than he had been commissioned to produce. It was created over a much longer period of time than was expected or convenient. It was more complex and time-consuming than even Tolkien himself anticipated. Writing the year's work of English studies, Margaret L. Lee praised the Middle English vocabulary for doing things Kenneth Sizem certainly had not meant it to do, such as devoting much space and care to the various meanings of the preposition to, and the various forms of the pronoun he, or the verb haben, rather than to suggest etymologies of the rare and obscure words contained in the text. This, said Lee, gave the work a value independent of the extracts to which it is appended. As an executive of Oxford University Press, Sison was naturally concerned with budgets, deadlines, and potential sales. No doubt economic factors influenced his ideas about scholarly books, but in his correspondence, he expressed strong personal views about their design and publication. In particular, he preferred that they have a limited number of notes and he was none too keen about glossaries, which because of their complex structure were expensive to set in type. After Sizem's death, the scholar Eugene Vanover wrote to the Times to defend Sizem's practice of thinning or dispensing with apparatus, what he called the undergrowth of scholarship, removing the outward appearance of learning to restore to the concept of scholarship its true meaning. Others looked upon Sizem less kindly, as Peter Sutcliffe wrote in his History of Oxford University Press, to some of his contemporaries, Sizem seemed a hard man. His many acts of generosity were seen as exceptions to a general rule of sternness bordering on parsimony. He was certainly unyielding, often stubborn, and on the rare occasions when he was persuaded to change his mind, there was a rumbling and creaking of machinery unaccustomed to shifts of gear. <laughs> Raymond Edwards remarks in his biography of Tolkien that Sizem was known for a briskly ruthless approach to philology and was temperamentally unsympathetic to Tolkien's more expansive and comprehensive approach in the Middle English vocabulary. 
Edwards also suggests, though I'm inclined to consider this more a matter of opinion than fact, that Sison's introductions to the individual texts in 14th century verse and prose have an undercurrent of robust Protestant or at least anti-Roman sentiment, which Tolkien, as a devout Catholic, could, can hardly have relished. Despite their differences, Tolkien and Sison remained on cordial terms. They were scholars in the same <coughs> field and gentlemen of their time. It was Sison who alerted Tolkien to the opening at Leeds. And when Tolkien was named Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, a chair for which both were finalists, Sison seems not to have held it against his rival. In any case, to, to, <clears throat> to return to Rainer Unwin's advice, as author and publisher, they needed each other. Tolkien, well respected for his learning and abilities, was consulted by Oxford University Press. And in mid-1921, even as he was still at work on the vocabulary, he was recruited to help prepare an edition of the Middle English poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which the press wanted badly to compete with the standard edition by Goins. For this, he was partnered with E.B. Gordon, one of the best recent linguist graduates in English. Gordon had been at Oxford, in part under Tolkien's tutelage, and became his, Ox his, his uh, colleague at Leeds. The two optimistically planned to produce Sir Gawain in a matter of months. <laughs> Oxford University Press approved, as they would for a matter of months, <coughs> provided that the book not exceed 160 pages, which Sizem had established as the standard for works in the Oxford series. But Tolkien and Gordon concluded that if they were forced to keep to this limit, they would have to cur curtail their apparatus, and the result would be merely a junior university textbook rather than a superior contribution to scholarship. Sizem was not pleased to be asked for another 40 pages, nor to hear that both Tolkien and Gordon had heavy teaching schedules, which prevented them from finishing Sir Gawain as quickly as they had hoped. Sizem disagreed with their estimate of length for their text proper, and he objected to a large glossary. The length of the book, he warned, had to be controlled in order to keep its price within the reach of university students. But he was willing to accept 200 pages, if the manuscript of the book was so accurate that proof correction of the press would be negligible, <laughs> that is relatively cost-free. Tolkien and Gordon argue that the language of Sir Gawain, a Midlands dialect of Middle English, not that of Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, was so different that it needed an unusual amount of glossing. They must have made their case, or a sizem was overruled from above, for their edition ran to 235 pages, including a 76-page glossary, which Tolkien, who wrote it, had promised to keep to 50. <laughs> As I've said, Tolkien has been criticized for not publishing more within his academic disciplines. It was not that he lacked ambition. He certainly wished to publish. Rather, he tried to do more than was possible. Uh, he had many ideas, some of which came to nothing, such as his suggestion, while still struggling to complete Sir Gawain, that he write an introduction to German philology. <laughs> Kenneth Seisman, Seisman expressed interest, provided that the book not be too long or too unreadable. <laughs> In the event, Tolkien did not endear himself to his academic publishers, gaining a reputation as a scholar who, though brilliant, was not to be trusted to meet deadlines or keep to established forms. From around 1923, for example, also while he was still engaged with Sir Gawain, until the 1960s, Tolkien was responsible for editing a selection of texts by Chaucer together with his colleague George S. Gordon. Neither was able to bring the project to a conclusion, and it became a derelict at Oxford University Press and the subject of, of complaints by Sizem and internal memos which blamed Tolkien for slow progress and for excessive correction of the base text by Skeet. Uh, also, in 1935, Tolkien formally agreed to produce for the Early English Text Society a, an edition of Ancrena Wissa, the important Corpus Christi College Cambridge manuscript of the Ancrena Rule, uh, a medieval set of rules for anchoresses or female religious recluses. But this work was not published until 1962, and only after many heated letters passed between Tolkien and his editors arguing how the manuscript should be presented. Tolkien had worked on a line-by-line -line transcription at great length before being engaged 
to publish his work for the Early English Text Society, to then have to alter it and thousands of references already keyed to folio and line to suit the society's house form for editions, which was not line by line, seemed onerous, merely, as it seemed to Tolkien, for the sake of consistency by the publisher. Tolkien also argued that a line by line transcription better suits the scholar interested in the finer points of the original manuscript. In 1937, the society's governing committee, probably weary of debate, gave way to Tolkien. But when, after many delays, the work resurfaced in 1958, a new editor, R. W. Birchfield, unaware of the decision made some 20 years earlier, expressed his own view that the transcription should be changed and the debate began again. <laughs> Birchfield's diplomacy was severely tested, as was Tolkien's composure in the face of late changes to his work made without his knowledge or consent. Birchfield, like Sison, was a fellow scholar in Middle English studies, and as a student at Oxford had been one of Tolkien's true followers, entranced by his lectures, especially those on the late 12th century Ormulum, which became the subject of Birchfield's postgraduate work under Tolkien's supervision. It may be ironic that Birchfield, though otherwise accomplished, even distinguished in this field, never completed his D. Phil. Tolkien's failures in regard to Chaucer and the return of Wissop, the former abandoned after much work, the text of the latter completed and presented as Tolkien preferred, uh, though he never wrote a formal introduction, cannot be explained wholly by perfectionism or crowded teaching schedules or domestic distractions such as the illnesses that often struck down Tolkien or his family, though they had these in abundance. For his critics are not wrong to say that the matter of Middle Earth often occupied his thoughts and at length, Tolkien's imaginative fiction also found a publisher, though he wasn't seeking one. Probably in 1935, and you'll remember that this is the same year that Tolkien agreed to produce an edition of Ancrena Wissa, and what he was still theoretically responsible for the Chaucer, Elaine Griffiths, one of his B-Lit students, suggested to the London publisher George Allen and Unwin that Tolkien prepare a new edition of John R. Clark Hall's Modern English Translation of Beowulf, last revised in 1911. Wisely judging that he did not have the time to spare for it, Tolkien suggested that the work be done by Griffiths herself under his direction. In the event, she failed to complete the revision, and although Tolkien offered to put the work in order, feeling an obligation to Alan Nunwin uh, as he had vouched for his student, he too was unable to proceed, and the project was turned over to his Oxford colleague C.L. Wren. Tolkien at last, in 1940, wrote a preface on translating Beowulf, which is brief but valuable. In the process, something even more important occurred. Susan Dagnall, a representative of Alan Nunwin, visited Oxford probably early in 1936, probably to speak with Elaine Griffiths or with Tolkien himself about the Clark Hall volume, and in some manner, accounts vary, saw the typescript of The Hobbit that Tolkien circulated to friends. Dagnall herself read it and convinced Tolkien that it should be published. How much convincing this took, no one has said. I suspect that not much was needed. <laughs> Unfortunately, Tolkien's earliest correspondence with Alan, Alan and Unwin has been lost. Certainly, he did not write The Hobbit for publication. It had been a story for his sons and for himself, and latterly for his friends. If he ever thought to publish it before Susan Dagnall came to call, it's not recorded. But it's clear from the care he took in preparing a circulating typescript with maps and illustrations that he looked upon it as if it could already be a published book. By 1936, Tolkien was no stranger to publishing academic works. Production of The Hobbit, though, was a very different experience. For one thing, the process moved far more swiftly than it had at Oxford University Press for a Middle English vocabulary for a certain way. For another, there was no one in Ellen and Unwin who was remotely like Kenneth Sison, mm -hmm. ruling with a firm hand and giving ground only grudging. For the Hop, Tolkien worked closely with Susan Dagnall as a general editorial assistant, with Charles Firth at a production, and with Stanley Unwin, chairman of Ellen and Unwin, who took a personal interest in all of his firm's business. These were three members of a house which Stanley Unwin's son Rayner later described as editorially led, medium sized, and self-financing. It published according to merit rather than market, 
and maintain trust with its authors and with its bookselling customers. By no means averse to publishing books that sold very well, Allen and Unwin nevertheless stood by their motto by which they published books that matter. George Allen had been the publisher of John Ruskin. Stanley Unwin, after forming Allen and Unwin, had Sigmund Freud and Bertrand Russell, even Lenin and Trotsky. He did not himself necessarily to subscribe to his author's views, but he felt that they deserved to be read. As for The Hobbit, it was of no consequence that Allen and Unwin had no children's books department specifically. Tolkien's book was judged to be one of quality, worthy of the publisher's attention. Rainer Unwin, who joined his family's firm in 1951 and rose himself to chairman, maintained this healthy attitude towards books for the rest of his days even as the world of publishing changed drastically with mergers and mega corporations. I'm too young to have known Alan and Unwin in the period when it was George, uh, George Allen and Unwin, uh, but I was honored to be able to do research in its files uh, and its successor, Unwin Hyman, even as, his as the offices were being dismantled after their sale to HarperCollins. And I like to think that something of the air of the firm's history when it worked directly with Tolkien still lingered. At least that was my impression while working in the firm's rooms in Soho, reading Tolkien's correspondence with Dagmar Firth and Unwin. You too will have a sense of what Alan and Unwin was like if you've read the printed volume of Tolkien's letters, nearly a third of which are addressed to the publisher. I'll spare you the full length of the story of Tolkien's dealings with Alan and Unwin for The Hobbit, which you can read in the Tolkien Companion and Guide. <laughs> on sale at a not good bookshop near you. <laughs> Uh, but we'll trust that Rainer Unwin wouldn't mind if I quote a few words about the subject from his memoir, George Allen and Unwin, A Remembrancer. By the end of 1936, he wrote, the typescript of The Hobbit had gone to the printers, and a long, patient, and courteous dialogue began to build up between author and publisher in order to ensure that this children's book by an unknown author was prepared for press in exactly the way that Tolkien wanted. The dialogue was almost entirely conducted by letter. In 1937 alone, Tolkien wrote 26 letters to George Allen and Unwin and received 31 letters in return. On Tolkien's part, these were all in handwriting, often up to five pages long, detailed, fluent, often pungent, but infinitely polite and exasperatingly precise. <laughs> The time and patience that his publishers devoted to what should have been a straightforward typesetting job is astonishing. <laughs> I doubt whether any author today, however famous, would get such scrupulous attention. It is too glib to assume that this all happened in a more leisurely age. Charles Firth was probably seeing 40 or 50 other books through the press, often of far greater complexity and on a wide spectrum of, of subjects during the same period in which he was dealing with The Hobbit. The telephone was seldom used. It was considered something of an intrusion, and anyway, far too extravagant to use at all frequently for long distance calls. Charles Firth once visited Tolkien in Oxford, and twice in the autumn of publication, Tolkien came to London by train, where he met my father for the first time, was overwhelmed by his kindness." <laughs> Unquote. Although Susan Dagnall had occasion to tell Tolkien that he had not at any time been in the least troublesome, <laughs> in fact, he caused a great deal of trouble for Alan and Unwin. He altered so much of The Hobbit in proof that the typesetting had to be completely revised, and even the corrected proofs did not make for perfect copy. His initial maps were drawn in multiple colors, and his dust jacket design likewise had more colors than Alan and Unwin's production budget could bear but he worked with Charles Firth and revised his art. He had not at first submitted illustrations in addition to maps, but then sent a few, which were accepted, though the publisher had not loved them in costs. And when those two were accepted, Tolkien sent still more. <laughs> Susan Dagnall cheerfully allowed, she was very cheerful, that this was not economical for Ellen and Unwin, but the art was too delightful not to include. And indeed, it makes for a superior book. Tolkien was disappointed, however, in that the moon runes on Thor's map had to be printed on its face rather than on its back, to be seen only when held up to a light, more or less as in the story. Alan and Unwin finally had to hold firm with costs, at least to the extent that Thor's map was printed as an end paper rather than as a separate sheet. 
In his memoir, Rader Unwin marvels that George Allen and Unwin really thought they were economizing by using the author as an amateur designer cum illustrator. <laughs> but he, sa he says, in those, uh, those happy days, cost-benefit analysis had scarcely been invented. <laughs> in fact, there were very successful precedents for this further author-publisher collaboration, such as Hugh Lofton, who illustrated his own Dr. Doolittle books, and Arthur Ransom, whose pictures came to be standard in his own Swallows and Amazon series. Their art was sometimes amateurish, but it suited their stories down to the ground. And Tolkien generally had a talent for art and, and design, especially pattern designing and lettering, so to have him illustrate and decorate his own story was not only aesthetically correct, it also pleased the author to have a measure of control over the appearance of his work. In the J.R.R. Tolkien Encyclopedia, Douglas Anderson states that the most striking fact of Tolkien's publishing history is how little he sought publication for his creative writings. I don't think this is at all striking, for Tolkien was not a professional writer. He was a professional scholar and teacher who also wrote fiction and poetry. And until The Hobbit was published, he had no reason to think that his imaginative writings would generate interest outside his small circle of family and friends. The urgency he felt to publish in 1915-16, to 16, to put his poems at least before the public, had diminished with the years as he settled into life as a husband and father and into the routine of an academic, and as his creative interests were focused for the most part on his private legendary. But in 1937, with a successful children's title in the shops, Stanley Unwin asked for another book about hobbits. At first, Tolkien had nothing more to say on the subject, but had other writings in his files. I should rather like an opinion, he wrote to Unwin, other than that of Mr. C.S. Lewis and my children, whether it has any value in itself or is a marketable commodity, apart from hobbits. At the moment, I am suffering like Mr. Baggins from a touch of staggerment, and I hope I am not taking myself too seriously. But I must confess that your letter, asking for a sequel uh, to The Hobbit, has aroused in me a faint hope. I mean, I begin to wonder whether duty and desire may not, perhaps in future, go more closely together. I have spent nearly all the vacation times of 17 years examining and doing things of that sort, driven by immediate financial necessity, mainly medical and educational, put his kids through school. Uh, I may perhaps now do <clears throat> what I much desire to do, that is to publish his works of the imagination while performing his academic tasks at Oxford and not fail of financial duty. Well, this was easier said than done. Tolkien offered Ellen and Unwin a buffet of writings, parts of the Silmarillion, for example, which the publisher's reader found incomprehensible, <laughs> and Mr. Bliss, which was then too expensive to print. Little of it was for children, and Stanley Unwin expected Tolkien to make his mark as a children's writer, The Hobbit having been written and marketed as a children's book. But Tolkien was soon inspired to begin his new Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings. As he had been for other works, he was too optimistic of how, about how quickly he could write it, and he underestimated its final length. Nor was he any less busy in his Oxford duties, especially during the fraught years of the Second World War. With completion of The Lord of the Rings delayed, Alan Nunwin published in 1949 Tolkien's Farmer Childs of Ham, a shorter work he had in hand, unrelated to Hobbits. The book trade found it bewildering, and Tolkien remarked to Stanley Unwin his belief that the publisher had not done enough to promote it. This complaint was part of a distrust by Tolkien of Alan Unwin, which had begun to mount 12 years before, when the publisher turned down the Silmarillion. Rightly so, with the work still far from complete, let alone commercial, but that was not how Tolkien saw it. On their part, Alan, Un Alan and Unwin found Tolkien, as Rainer Unwin has said, an author of undoubted talent, but of distracted and disorganized achievement. The two books they had published for him, The Hop Farmer Giles, though successful, had absorbed more time in overheads than, say, the entire output of Bertrand Russell. <laughs> Moreover, by October 1949, when he finished a draft of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien had come to feel strongly that that work should be published with the Silmarillion as one long saga of the jewels and the rings. At this time, he also made the acquaintance of Milton Waldman, senior editor at 
London publisher Collins, <clears throat> who read The Lord of the Rings and parts of The Silmarillion and expressed an interest in publishing both. This was enough to convince Tolkien to change publishers if he had not had that thought already. A draft of a letter to, by Tolkien to Milton Walden suggests that he was of two minds about the morality of his decision. I should be glad to leave Alan and Lennon, he wrote, as I have found them in various ways unsatisfactory. But I have friendly personal relations with Stanley, whom all the same I do not, not much like, and with his second son, Rainer, whom I do like very much. Sir Stanley has long been aware that The Lord of the Rings has outgrown its function as a children's book and is not pleased since he sees no money in it for anyone, so he said. But he is anxious to see the final result all the same. If this constitutes a moral obligation, then I have one, at least to explain the situation. And this he did. The, uh, and the Unwin's father and son, in reply, and with due diligence, explored how their firm might publish so massive and therefore costly a work. They were concerned especially with The Lord of the Rings, uh, less so with The Silmarillion. But Tolkien gave them an ultimatum, published both works or none, which there was no choice but to decline. As Rainer Unwin put it, Father felt hurt, but there was little he could do about it. He pointed out that he was being forced to make a decision about books that he had not even seen, and whose extent he had had no opportunity to check but he was always ready to renew the search for ways and means to publish. Tolkien seems not to have considered that the same calculations of cost and marketability would be made also by Collins, or that at Collins only Milton Waldman was enthusiastic about the project, and he was abroad most of the time. In the event, Collins demanded cuts, which Tolkien did not want to make. Humboldt, he returned to Allen and Unwin uh, through his long friendship with Rainer Unwin, who at age 10 had written a positive review of The Hobbit, which clinched his father's decision to publish it. But The Lord of the Rings, lengthy as it was by itself, would have to be published alone. <clears throat> Rainer now took the lead, convincing his father to approve publication of The Lord of the Rings, a work of genius, though Alan and Unwin stood to lose money. <laughs> it was a highly unusual book, but one that mattered. It was divided into three volumes to be published at intervals so that readers' interest could be gauged with each part the cost of printing spread. On his part, Tolkien was pers persuaded to accept a profit-sharing agreement whereby he would receive no advance or royalty until prime costs of production were made back, but then returns on sales would be split equally between author and publisher. This proved to be a very good decision indeed for Tolkien, <laughs> and continues to be good for his estate. Production did not move as quickly as it had done for The Hobbit. There were delays of revision and of the completion of the appendices in The Return of the King, so that the third volume appeared more than a year after the first. As in 1937, there were questions of design. Again, Tolkien took an interest in the appearance of this book, down to the choice of fonts, and he contributed to its decoration while his son Christopher drew its maps. He made no illustrations as he had done for The Hobbit, except for his own purposes, uh, which was just as well, but the publisher's budget allowed for only minimal art and under no circumstance for color reproductions of Tolkien's laborious facsimiles of pages from the dwarves' Bruin book of Mazarbul. In his remembrance, Sir Rainer Unwin provides a good summary of the years following the publication of The Lord of the Rings, when Tolkien's life became more complicated by fame, issues of American copyright, the Ace Books piracy of The Lord of the Rings, negotiations over film contracts, and difficulties with the Puffin Books Hobbit, in which the printers took it upon themselves to correct Tolkien's dwarves to dwarfs. <laughs> Through all of this, Allen and Unwin's staff, not only Rainer Unwin and his assistant Joy Hill, supported and protected Tolkien to the best of their ability and published further small books by him, such as Smith of Wooten Major, while waiting in vain to, for him to complete the Silmarillion. It's been su suggested that Tolkien did not want to complete his legendarium because he did not want to give up the process of its creation, uh, with which he had lived for so long. We need not think this, although it may be true, uh, when scholars like Dimitri Femi have observed how difficult it would have been to satisfactorily integrate Tolkien's two visions of his created world 
the mythical and the historical, and how laborious it was to make the older tales of Middle-earth consistent with the settled text of the Lord of the Rings. And as Christopher Tolkien commented, his father, towards the end of his life, found himself with too much to do and too tired to do it. In any case, it cannot be doubted that Tolkien wanted the Silmarillion to be published. This is clear, at least, from his offer of parts of it to Alan Unwin in 1937 and to Alan, Un Alan and Unwin and Collins in 1950. From his return to the mythology after the success of The Lord of the Rings, uh, after the success of Lord of the Rings ensured that the Silmarillion would have a guaranteed audience, and from his appointment of his son Christopher to manage his literary estate and bring, if he would, the scattered in various parts of the legendarium into a coherent whole. This latter act of foresight gave rise, as Rader Unwin has said, to a new relationship between the executors of Tolkien's estate and the publisher, a relationship that has proved just as close and cooperative as it was with the original author, and which has resulted in the unique situation in which not only have more books by Tolkien been published after his death than during his lifetime, but the sale of all his books has continued to increase year by year. It's a curious feeling to think that I myself and others at this conference, through our work with Tolkien's writings, have become at least tangentially part of this same relationship between author and publisher which meant so much to Tolkien and has been of such great meaning and benefit to us all. Thank you very much. Okay, we can take about 10 minutes of questions. What I want to do is I'm going to start on this side of the room and I'm going to walk around and come around this side of the room. So we got any questions over here? Ooh. You stunned them into silence. Christina and I have this effect on you. Uh, when we, certainly when we, we answer something on Facebook, it's usually a, that's it. Okay. Please ask questions. I shall, I shall come round. Is there any more? Any over here? Cool. No, I'm over that side of the room. Okay. So it seems like such an important reference. Is it a microphone It shouldn't be. It is. It is. Very close. I wouldn't remember it, sir. It seems like such an important reference work, and it's so difficult to find. Do uh, you think there's any chance of it being reprinted? I know that publisher has no interest, but... Well, that was, that was Rainer's son, Merlin. Um, oh, I, many people have asked that, and uh, it certainly is. Um, uh, it probably should be, uh, you know, you know uh, copy edited a little bit. There is a, there's a quick typesetting. Um, uh, we have our copies, so yes, that's fine. But uh, uh, no, I, I, I agree. It's, it's something that uh, is, is really a prime thing, and there are very few copies of it around. I think it's been, it, it has been suggested, I think I'm right, that, that it's been suggested to Merlin that it be done. But, uh, and Merlin is a, is a publisher, but just not of that kind of book. I don't know. I, would, I think it would be something great for HarperCollins to do, given the history. Yeah. Um, so, uh, talking about uh, Tolkien's uh, desire to and inability to uh, complete the Silver Region and have it, uh, having it published, uh, would you venture any uh, any guesses as to, to how much would be his um, simply the, the, the enormity of the task itself and, and how much would be his inability to stop nickling the protocol? It's really impossible to say, of course, uh, because uh, it, it was this continuing and evolving creation of this 
because Christopher is dead. Uh, uh, Tolkien would have had to, of course, revise large portions of it. His thinking had changed so much over the years that he would have put, had to put himself back in the mindset of decades earlier. I think that you know, under normal circumstances, at his his pace, it, it would have been decades longer, uh, and you know, circumstances just just weren't going to allow them. It was it's a it's a wonder that Christopher did what he did in in, in just a few years, um, but then <clears throat> look how long he took to uh, then go through the whole bit again uh, for the history of learn. Chris, hold the microphone close. Um, the uh, um, did Tolkien have a, uh, a very direct relationship with his publishers, or were there intermediaries like uh, secretary or his family? He did have an agent, and although he had a succession of secretaries who occasionally would you know, send out a letter, it's basically all himself. Um, when we were <coughs> uh, writing our chronology, we uh, were you know that have had a lot of material to draw upon in the common room archive. Uh, at certain points, though, we figured that that uh, you know he did meet personally with. We know that he met personally with uh, people from the publisher, uh, and uh, or did use the telephone. And and there, if something is lost, you can just confer that. But no, it wasn't. It wasn't like uh, you know. Uh, authors today who, who've got an agent and the agent's going to go and negotiate contracts and so forth. Um, it was a simpler time. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what's the status of the publisher that any knowledge of things like this to all of these companies that have gone to the Indian South America, or the Ocean Compact, or the Shadow, or the Devil, which leads us to these two cells? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure where you're going with that. Sorry, about, yeah, um, the, the, the thing in unfinished tales. Yes. Well, did, that, did he actually ever take those publishers, or did they, did they just not work Well, some of it was, was written, some of it was written to the Lord of the Rings, and there was no room. Uh, other things are things he was working on. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, <coughs> sort of the importance wasn't seen until, you know, uh, post Silmarillion. Um, he certainly didn't give everything to, to the publisher. I mean, the publishers would not have known, I'm not sure even Christopher knew how much was in the box files uh, until his thought to die. Uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, can I ask you to look into a crystal ball or a volunteer or something um, for the future? At some point, uh, Tolkien's works will be out of copyright. <laughs> What's going to happen at that point in terms of publishing, both in terms of the stuff that's, that's you know, in various archives of the world and in terms of, say, the history of Middle Earth that might be published in different formats or organizations or something like that? Well, the history of Middle Earth, of course, came up much, you know, rather later. Uh, and even Tolkien, you know, for life plus 70 years is still ways down the line. Uh, <coughs> And uh, you know, it, it, uh, barring further changes to the copyright law, further extensions, uh, uh, I mentioned some things will, will become public domain, uh, while others will be constrained by uh, the, you know, the use of new editions or uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other, other devices of publication. Uh, uh, you know, Tolkien wanted his, the benefit of his publications to, be, to go to his family, and uh, I think the estate will uh, continue that as, as long as possible. That's that's uh, that's their responsibility. Uh, it's I'm, I'm trying to think as far that far ahead, and I think well, you know, I'm going to be really old. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Well, thank you very much, Wayne.